Thank you. And as a scientist and the daughter of a kick-ass geologist mother, I'm very pleased to be here just after International Women in Science Day as well. <laughs> exactly. So the story about understanding of animal culture starts in 1954 when a young Japanese macaque started taking provisioned sweet potatoes down to the sea to wash them. And this behavior was picked up by other young macaques and then spread throughout macaque society where it still in fact persists today. And uh, the researchers at the time labeled this as a what they called proto-culture. We then need to uh, fast forward to get a perspective that combines this with ecology to the 1990s when researchers working at chimpanzee sites across Africa began to collate their data sets and noticed that the behaviors they were describing in each of their different research sites were not necessarily being observed in all of them. So one example of this is what's called the hand clasping grooming behavior in chimpanzees, where they hold hands when they groom. They do this in some sites, but not all in Africa. And in the sites where they do do this behavior, we see that in some they uh, hold hands and in others they lock wrists. So this might sound like a kind of a bit of a weird oddity, but when the researchers compared notes, they found this wasn't the only example. In some sites in Africa, chimpanzees use stone tools to crush nuts. In other sites, they use termite, uh, they use sticks to fish for termites. And in total, um, Andy White and Jane Goodall, Christoph Bosch and their colleagues uh, identified 39 cultural uh, variants which uh, were apparently differing between sites and could not be uh, given an, explan an explanation that was clearly ecological or genetic. Uh, so, where do I come into this story? Well, uh, I was a, um, whoops, sorry. So, uh, I should pause here and say that while chimpanzees are the flagship species for the uh, discovery and description of what we call animal culture, they're not the only case. And uh, more recent research has shown that uh, we see cultural behavior in New Caledonian crows, in tool use, in foraging behaviors in dolphins and killer whales and in other whales, and in bird song, where birds uh, from different populations often sing different tunes, and we've labeled this as uh, song dialects. And I should pause here and explain what I mean by animal culture. So we mean very broadly a behavior which is socially learned, so that is learned by copying another individual, is shared by members of a group or a community, and differs uh, between communities, and persists over time and perhaps over generations. In the case, case of uh, tool use in chimpanzees, archeological evidence is actually now showing us that it's persisted for sometimes thousands of years. Uh, so where do I come into this story? Well, as a young uh, graduate in Australia, I was lucky enough to be given the opportunity to come study the social ecology of great tits in this long-running research site at the University of Oxford, Whiteham Woods. Um, and I didn't know much about this quintessential little British bird, uh, but I knew one story, and that's a story that uh, some of you might know as well, of milk bottle opening. So, in 1921, uh, tits were first observed piercing the tops of milk bottles on doorsteps and stealing cream. And uh, at the time, uh, Fisher and Hind, in an early example of citizen science, began to collate these reports and were able to show that the behavior appeared to have two independent sites of origin. And then over the next gen 20 years, until milk bottle designs change, spread uh, geographically and also in, showed a cumulative uptake in the population. And when I began to look at this, I found it amazing that, uh, firstly, this is 30 years before it was first observed in those Japanese macaques. And secondly, nobody had then gone back and experimentally tested how this might have happened, what process uh, what were we seeing for this spread of innovation. So we don't know for sure what happened in this case, but we could hypothesize it might have looked something like this. Uh, we had a new opportunity, cream, an innovation on the part of some number of individuals to access that cream, pierce the foil. 
uh, social learning and the transmission of this innovation throughout the population, leading to a population level change in behavior that persisted over generations and we might be able to call something like animal culture. So uh, with a team of social ecologists, we uh, microchipped a bunch of birds in Whiteham Woods uh, with these little microchips, the same that you'd put on your cat or dog. And this allowed us to remotely track them when they came to foraging patches across the woodland. And this is a network superimposed over the map of that same woodland where every bird is a dot. The line between the dots are the social connection between them, so the amount of time they spend foraging together and uh, the color of the social communities we can identify in the wider population. So effectively, what we're building here is a social network of birds. I went into this social network and I targeted uh, two birds from every social community that I brought into captivity, uh, not to train to open milk bottles, but to solve this little sliding door task. So they could slide this door either to the left or right. I trained them on one direction and they get a mealworm reward. I then put these tasks back out into the wild and observed uh, hundreds of birds in each social community solving it to get food, the vast majority of whom were solving using the same technique that the original bird uh, had shown that I introduced. But in every task, there was an equally difficult, equally rewarding alternative sliding the other way. So the fact they're all showing the same behavior is really good evidence we have for social learning, that they're learning by copying each other. We could also observe it spreading through the social network. So here, the two yellow dots are the trained innovators I seeded in, and they're turning red in the order in which they learn the behavior. And hopefully, as you can see, it spreads across the social network and social connections are really important for the order in which the birds learn. And more than that, uh, we also put these tasks back out over three generations and we're able to show that the behavior once established in the population persisted strongly over time. So effectively, an experimentally induced animal culture. And I think this work for me was very exciting because it demonstrated that uh, an innovation to a new opportunity on the part of a very small number of individuals is a realistic mechanism to observe population level change in behavior. And in our modern world, where uh, many animals no longer live in the environments we might think that they uh, evolved in or experienced over evolutionary time, but rather in rapidly uh, changing and highly modified environments, this could be a very uh, fundamentally important mechanism for behavioral flexibility to allow uh, rapid adaptation that's not possible on genetic timescales or evolutionary timescales. So uh, while this is, I think, uh, a good news story for many of the animals uh, that we see and that we live with and interact, uh, we also need to think about the way in which cultural knowledge can be shaped by the impact and influence of successive generations over time. And we call this process cultural inheritance. And when that cultural knowledge is lost from populations entirely, it can also be very hard to regain. And the best example for this comes from my learned migration routes. So in uh, bighorn sheep and moose in uh, the US, in populations that were completely exterminated by hunting and then reintroduced, we found, uh, or researchers found by Brett Jesper and colleagues, that it can take decades to even regain migration as a behavior in those populations and between 90 and 150 years uh, to regain the sort of optimal migration routes that were once observed in healthy populations. But when we know about this and we know that cultural knowledge is important, we also have a way of uh, hijacking this system to, for the powers of good, you could say, in our conservation efforts. And the best example of this comes from the fantastic work that's been done in hooping cranes in the US as well. So here, conservationists have used microlite airplanes to effectively train young birds that are being reintroduced on where to migrate. And these young birds can then act as the older experienced individuals for the next generation of wild-born chicks. So we can kind of reinsert 
migratory behavior back into this population. And I think what animal culture uh, research can tell us about when it comes to conservation is how important it is not only to conserve uh, numbers of individuals and populations, but also to conserve knowledge that's held in animal populations, and how we need to consider this when we, also, when we think about targeting our conservation efforts. But the flip side of this is that it also tells us that in some species, behavior is not fixed, but responding in real time to the sort of selective pressures that we're placing upon it. And so uh, we can clearly see this in urban environments where some animals have adapted very successfully. Um, for example, my recent research on sulfur-crested cockatoos, which are a very successful urban adapter in Australia. But more than this, it tells us that behavior in these environments is actually a dialogue. So we shape the behavior of animals by providing new opportunities and new challenges. They're responding to this, but by thriving in our uh, highly modified urban and human environments, they're also uh, shaping our behavior as well. For example, by becoming increasingly tame or giving us opportunities to interact with them. And fundamentally, and I think more broadly than this, animal culture uh, tells us that animals other than humans have uh, rich social and cultural and interesting lives, which uh, I hope is a perspective that will increase empathy for animals as we begin to see them uh, not just as numbers, but also as interesting individuals. And in an increasingly disconnected world, I think this is more important than ever before. Thank you.